On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and I'm so excited to welcome Clint Patterson. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks, Laurie. <laughs> and so, again, we will detect this accent. So you are literally in another day off on the other side of the world. And we'll get to that in a minute. But could you tell us a little bit about your story and the debilitating that you disease that you had, but you were able to conquer with some lifestyle changes? Yes. And when I first was told I had rheumatoid arthritis, I certainly couldn't spell it. I didn't even know what it was. Uh, and I was uh, completely naive as to the severity of it. Uh, no one in our family has the condition or ever discussed or knew anyone with the condition. So, um, you know, uh, the doctor looked at my joints and I had, uh, he's pressing around on my feet. I had sore metatarsals. I had sore fingers and, um, and he ran some blood tests and called me back in and was very, very heavy in his tone and said, I, I have to let you know that you have rheumatoid arthritis and like it just didn't it just was like water off a duck's back because i just didn't know what that meant mm -hmm. and he said i've got to urgently get you to see a specialist and i thought this guy's really kind of overreacting here uh, because i just didn't know then the rheumatologist meeting he he uh, looked at my blood again that had been tested and i was really high elevation of uh, rheumatoid factor and anti-ccp antibodies uh, my C-reactive protein and SED rate are really high. And uh, he said, we've got to start you on methotrexate immediately. And um, I said, well, how long will I need to take that? And he's like, well, most patients are on that for their life. And I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? I mean, this is just insane. And so I asked for it for 12 months to think about it. I think I just said, look, give me some time. And he said, well, book in again when you're ready. And he wasn't one of the common, uh, the, the, the sometimes sort of old school uh, rheumatologists that laugh and say, you'll be back or something like that. He is a mm. lovely gentleman. Mm. And he just said, looks, okay, see how you go. And he said, but you're in so much pain. I can't leave here without giving you at least some painkillers. Uh, mm. And I said, okay. So he gave me a prescription for some really high strength ibuprofen. Mm. And I went home and I started taking these ibuprofens three times a day, super high strength stuff. And all the pain disappeared from the ibuprofen. I'm like, that's all I need to do. I just need to take ibuprofen three times a day for the rest of my life. And I don't oh need the methotrexate. <laughs> <laughs> but what wow. happened was uh, the, the, uh, the effectiveness of the ibuprofen after three weeks had diminished greatly. And after three weeks, I thought, oh, I feel like I need to take like a lot more to get the same results. Mm. And uh, so I did my first experiment with rheumatoid arthritis, the first of thousands. I thought, okay, I'm going to see what happens if I stop the ibuprofen and I stopped the ibuprofen. And prior to taking it, I was about like a five, six out of 10, like constant pain levels. Mm. And after taking it, I was a permanent eight. And oh, wow. I thought I'm in deep trouble because yeah. the thing that I thought I needed to do and I was happy to take frequently now appears to have made me permanently worse. And now I'm scared of the disease and I'm terrified of the drug. Wow. So wow. I went into a state of my first panic. And that was the beginning of what is a extremely long and detailed up and down, mostly down, 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 mm -hmm. down, 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 down. <laughs> and then some occasional ups and eventually a really high up that wow. leads me to speaking with you and, and sharing maybe some more of where we went from what there. Doing. Absolutely. So can we back up a little bit and just say you yeah. were okay until when? <laughs> yeah, How did this when. present itself? Yeah. Oh, feet first. Uh, mm. I, when I got out of the uh, bed one morning, I was actually uh, touring, if you like, or doing some entertainment jobs. Uh, yeah, we got to talk state. about that too, because that's right. really interesting. Yes. <laughs> right. So yeah, so I, I've, I've been doing stand up comedy since I was 27. And wow. um, at that point, I, when I was 31, my agent, which I was pleased to have established after a few years, and I got an agent, and he sent me to Brisbane, which is a, the capital city of another state here in Australia. And I was uh, 
I was staying at a friend's house and I got out of bed one morning and thought, that's weird. My, my feet are tender. And it was mm. a strange pain. It's different. Uh, rheumatoid pain is different than anything you, you get when you're otherwise healthy. It's just a weird pain. And uh, it was in the balls of my feet and I kept pushing into them thinking, what is that? Because it, mm. uh, so I thought I'd left my feet out of the covers at night and they'd gotten cold. And so I focused on that, but then it went into my fingers and, and then uh, that led me into uh, seeing that, that the doctor that ran the blood test when I got back to Sydney. So gotcha. that's how it started. And I want to, and I sometimes forget to say this, and I, it's popped into my mind, so I'll say it right now, sort of out of order. But I took antibiotics for five years as a teenager, five years from the age of 16 through 21 for bad acne. And after that, my digestive system in my 20s was awful. So I'd have a lot of, a lot of burping, gassiness. And uh, I had identified that if I'd eat ice cream, I immediately had my nose passage like blocked. So I couldn't breathe through my nose. It was an immediate reaction. Wow. And I was living a 20s lifestyle with some awesome friends and we were having a wonderful time. I wasn't atrocious with my eating, but I was just twenties eating. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which is do. atrocious. It's all good. <laughs> right, right. Most and, of us uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, and then I booked a job to perform for the troops, the U.S. Mm. and Australian and the European troops in Iraq. Mm. And this was when I was uh, thirty. And okay. when I went over there, the anti-malaria protocol was to take the exact same antibiotic for three months that I'd taken for five years as a Doxycycline. teenager. Doxycycline. Doxycycline. Mm. And three months after I returned to Australia from Iraq, I developed rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, wow. You think, yeah. I wonder if that was just the tipping point then, huh? Just enough to kind of yeah so that's for me um now i see that a lot so the three things that come up the most when i hear from other people i have questionnaires what do you think may have played a part um after childbirth comes up all the time yeah uh, um antibiotics as a teenager comes up all the time antibiotic mm. for acne and also um having a pre-diagnosis of Hashimoto's we've spoken oh, about this yeah. yeah interesting yeah it's an interesting yeah so a lot of people's history um, that shows up as a as in the history of it so those three things um, and I don't have the statistics for that but just anecdotally those come up uh, enough for me to go hmm that there's a pattern there definite trend mm. yeah mm -hmm. for that sure. is interesting yeah, because the Hashimoto's showed up with me during pregnancy with number two. So, and mm -hmm. he actually was interesting. He was born with um, elevated TSH at birth and uh, two weeks later it had cleared, but he'd had a pretty severe uh, dyslexia. And so he had that challenge. And I, I truly feel responsible for that because I didn't know, but it really is a huge component of, I'm sure, of, of his cause of his uh, reading disability. But which he's overcome with hard work and steadfast strength that I don't know how, where he got. So, but anyway, going back to your situation. So this, over this period of time, and you, you said you waited 12 months before you went back to rheumatologist, what happened from mm -hmm. that point forward? What was that journey then? Disaster. So oh. I went downhill like precipitously. Oh. Um, I had a torn ACL in my left knee because I had played football uh, without you know warming up and stretching and um you know it'd been a while since i'd played and i ran out and i tore my acl and i people on the other side of the field heard it pop i mean it oh. was a nasty nasty thing hmm. and i wasn't able to treat that because my inflammation was so high in my body there's no surgeon wanted to touch it because they won't do an operation on a to repair an acl whilst you are have a knee that's blown up with rheumatoid arthritis and so right. there was this back and forth and eventually I I went back to the rheumatologist and I could barely walk I had RA in my jaw my chest in the uh, the, the sort of the uh, tissue connective tissue to my to my breastbone um, uh, terribly in the knee uh, left elbow at that point that, uh, that later became both elbows wrists 
back of my knuckles, nodules on the side of my right foot, uh, still inflamed in the feet and all of my fingers. So uh, wow. just a basket case, like blown up like a Christmas tree. And uh, I said, look, I've, I'm going nowhere to the doctor. And can you please, please give me this drug? And I thought I'd explored all options. I was so naive. You know, I think about when I was at university. So, I, you know, I finished high school, did my first year of university and partied hard. Second year, I really buckled down. I worked my bottom off and I got like really great results. And at the end of the second year, I thought, I think I know everything about my degree. I've just learned so much. I feel like there's nothing you could possibly learn. I remember saying that to my friends. I've just learned so much. And then in my third year, at the end of the third year, I felt like I knew nothing because there was just so much content. It was mind blowing. And the same with at the, at the rheumatology at the end of a first year of going backwards mm. so badly, I thought I've tried everything I could. I've, I've taken those supplements. I've done glycosamine sulfate. Mm. I've tried chondroitin. You know, I've tried fish oils. There's nothing left because that was the information available at the time. Mm. It was 2006 when I was diagnosed, right? So oh, wow, wow. We're going back 15 years, right? Okay. And so I... Uh, I said, okay, give me the methotrexate thinking that's going to be it. I'm going to be fine now because I've agreed. I've conceded. Let's go on the drugs and I'll just take the drugs and I'll be happy. But the drug didn't get rid of all the pain. Mm. And that's where the dilemma began. Wow. What am I going to do now? Because I thought that was to be all and end all. But all it did was get rid of 60% of the pain. Melissa was still helping me to the bathroom at night. I still couldn't pull earplugs out of my ears in the morning because my elbow wouldn't bend enough. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it was absolutely shocking. I had elbow, so I had a full elbow synovectomy on the fourth year after diagnosis, a complete elbow synovectomy. Can you explain what that is for the audience? What they yeah, right. Do? Yeah. So, again, yeah, I knew not what that was either. Um that's when you go and see a really tired surgeon who sees way too many patients and he touches your elbow for about 10 seconds and says, let's run a scan and then contacts you and says, you need surgery. Here's the time and date. And it's going to be four and a half thousand out of pocket. And you wow. contact your, you contact your dad and say, dad, I need money because I'm a stand up comedian. I got no money and I need you to pay for my surgery. And, oh. and, um, yeah. And so that's what happened. And then what they do is they cut away. So it's a major surgery and they, they cut away all of the inflamed synovium, which is mm. the lining around our joints that houses our synovial fluid to keep them lubricated. And when that gets inflamed through rheumatoid, then that, 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 that uh, can be, it turns out, all cut out and then it regrows again. And when it regrows again, it tends to not get afflicted with rheumatoid again. It's quite interesting. Hmm. And mine has had that experience. Like it's never come back in that left elbow. Wow. Um, and the left elbow, besides being heavily osteoarthritic because of the damage that was done to the joint, sure. um, it supports me doing you know, a lot of chin-ups and a lot of pull-ups and yeah, at the moment. So Nice. Um, that's that, but, but the recovery from that surgery is 10 hours a day on a continuous passive motion machine, uh, wow. for six weeks. So I was doing, oh. I did six weeks, 10 hours a day. Oh and my. I was just breaking just to, you know, go to the bathroom get a little exercise and get back on the machine. It was, I got photos of it. I mean, it's ugly and it's, yeah, these are some nasty days, Laurie. This is, oh I mean, God. I said to my wife at one point, I said, you, you at times, I think you'd be better off if I got hit by a bus. And I meant that. And like, we had a lot of tears and she was out here visiting me or not, it was more than visiting, but she came out to see if our relationship might be, you know, one that could last forever. Uh, she's from Orlando and she, she and I met uh, in Australia on her, um, on her uh, six month um, semester of one of her international business units when she was at university mm. and she had gone home and that's another whole long story but anyway she'd come out to live with me and uh, here she was you know with no family no friends 
and now her her potential husband to be is a cripple and so mm. it's tough times for her and so we got yeah uh we we she was being plant-based her whole life she was born into a vegetarian family oh and she's, interesting she never tasted meat she doesn't know what it tastes like she's never wow. had a single slither um yeah and she's like come on honey you've got to eat more plants and uh I said, but if I'm, you know, I'm a skinny guy. I said, if I, if I stop eating meat, like you won't be able to see me behind a pole, you know, I'll just be Mm -hmm. so skinny and uh, so worried about that. But slowly we, you know, she succeeded in getting me off the the meat. I started to feel a little bit better, Mm. but the pivotal moment was when I had food poisoning and I had vomiting and diarrhea from, from both ends. And after food poisoning, all the pain disappeared from my body. And so um, I thought it has to be something to do with vomiting and diarrhea or it has to have something to do with being empty. And so that's when I went and did a a three-day water fast a few weeks later and saw all the pain disappear again and thought, no one on this earth can tell me that it hasn't got something to do with my digestive system. It has to. There's no other explanation. And so that began the insane exploration into what can I eat so that I can have the littlest pain possible. Wow. Mm. Wow. So how did your experiment start with, where did you even begin? I was reading many, many books at this time about health and nutrition because Melissa was passionate and pushing me to go down that path. And I had been reading a lot of books about enzyme therapy, enzymes, raw foods. And so that's where I went. I did an eight month raw vegan diet where all of my calories were coming from soaked nuts and soaked seeds and fruits. It was hard. It was really hard, but I massively reduced my C-reactive protein and my rheumatologist was looking at my cholesterol and he's like, whatever you're doing with your cholesterol could be sold and you could become, he, he said like, he couldn't, he couldn't believe my cholesterol. I guess m- maybe he has patients that struggle with cholesterol or he has a personal passion in it, but I was so interested in talking about my blood markers with inflammation. And he's just like, but your cholesterol, how did <laughs> yeah. you do that? <laughs> what were your numbers with your cholesterol? Where did they go oh, from to? It was, it was like, it was so low that, uh, and I, I actually haven't looked at it for so many years that I can't remember what the reference range is. Yeah. Um, but it, I think I don't, yeah, there was a lower limit to the reference range and I was actually a little below that. So it was wow. low. Yeah. Yeah. On raw I, vegan, raw vegan. Then. I have a few patients that hit the double digits, like in their total cholesterol. And it's just, right. they were actually, one of them was actually denied an insurance policy because his cholesterol was too low. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious? Right, right. Who's making these decisions? <laughs> anyway, but yes. Okay. That's fascinating. So your markers all dropped and mm. wow. Mm. So just fruit and soaked nuts. And, and seeds. seeds. Yeah. But I was making some mistakes during that time. And they were some mm. crucial things that I later learned. My wife wanted to put um, oils on my salads because she felt that that was going to, you know, we're in the healthy fat sort of mm-hmm. mindset at this point. Yeah. And uh, those, and, and while that's a good mindset, the vehicle in which those were coming were through olive oil on my salad. And, and when one night she said, I have to go and do something, she went to a yoga class or something. And I said, I'll make, you know, make my dinner. And, and I didn't put the oil on there. And the next morning, noticeably better noticeably oh, and she argued with me but where are you getting your fats and I said I don't care I know where I'm getting my pain and I want to get rid of that <laughs> so we 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 got rid of the oils and I was also loading my smoothies with flax seeds and other uh, uh, sometimes even putting nuts in my smoothies and then I found that if I separated the fats and ate them separately rather than putting them all together I had much better digestion and I wasn't running to the bathroom all the time. And so just some of these breakthroughs were being discovered over an eight month period. And then I read a book by Dr. Hiromi Shinya, a Japanese born gastroenterologist who lives in New York. And he was the inventor of the first non-invasive polyp removing tool 
for gastroenterologists. And he wrote a book called The Enzyme Factor. Okay, so I'm still in this enzyme world of thought. Uh, and he described what he ate on a daily basis. And he ate buckwheat, quinoa, millet, brown rice, and amaranth. Now, amaranth, buckwheat, and quinoa, I had barely eaten. Right? It was just things in millet, I still have barely eaten. And, I, and he said that he's been eating this nearly three times a day for his entire career. And I oh, thought, wow. oh my, exactly. Like this guy's like hardcore. So I thought I'm going to try that because he says that's optimal for the human colon. Mm. He also said that he's never seen a colon of a human patient in his life that frequently eats dairy that looks normal. Oh, I would believe that in a heartbeat, a hundred percent. And I, yeah, it's wow. fascinating. Uh, well, statement. it's when, um, when you're in medical school or you're in your training and you do, cause I'm family medicine. So my residency included pediatrics. And first thing they teach you is that, you know, of course you're testing children for, cause I, I saw kids, I still see kids, but with uh, their iron levels and right after about a year old and you're just like, why shouldn't they, why are there a risk for anemia? But apparently, so the more milk they drink, it's been well known for many decades. I'm over two decades of being a doctor now. So is literally um, what you would see is there's more milk they drink. It causes inflammation and bleeding in the intestines. So you have to tell them to scale back on the milk. And what didn't, now I look back and go, Lori, why didn't you think about why would I tell someone to drink milk that's causing bleeding that might lead to me? What on earth <laughs> would make me think that's all the advertisement? Exactly right. It does not surprise me. And we started at such a young age. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-uh. So yes, it's, uh, it, it's um, fascinating. And, and so that's what led me into eating like he did. So I started oh. eating like he did. And I put a list in and I said, I've got to toss the millet. I cannot eat millet, right? <laughs> so I got rid of that. I, and, and I noticed the brown rice. I wasn't sure about that, but I went with those pseudo grains. I put those three pseudo grains into my food mm. and I became Dr. Dishinya. I ate that <laughs> same meal. I ate that same meal every single day for 12 months. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You, that's all you ate were those three things every day for three months you're like the potato spud andrew I'm like, taylor I'm like andrew. I'm like andrew. <laughs> and i added to it only some seaweed and a ton of leafy greens and uh, i can't wow. recall now if i ate some fruit here and there but generally i was a little basically a little shinya and uh i gotta tell you eating cooked food after eight months of raw was a dream oh. i didn't care that it was simple because I was coming from raw and that is hard. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. And I tried was, doing a raw diet for like a month and I thought I was going to die. I was like, I just, oh, I, I yeah. keep, I crave my beans. I crave my yep. grains. I was like, uh, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you never, well, I never really quite ever felt satisfied like food wise, mm, no matter how exactly. much I ate or something, something anyway, people can wow. do it. And people that's and God bless them. Good to them. I yeah. God bless them. Myself. <laughs> so the the shinya mix was a godsend yeah. and i didn't have a pain bump shifting from raw which remember the pain had gone right down on raw and i did not get a pain bump then going on to those cooked foods and yeah. then after that 12 months of that and doing bikram yoga 360 days out of 365 in a 12 month period i mean i had to exercise my little bottom off at the end of that I was able to start introducing other foods and tapering the meds and eventually, eventually uh, was, was not requiring the medication to, uh, to, to, to uh, have my CRP of one and and so on. So, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it's like so hard though. It was so hard for me because I, I didn't take a direct path from A to B with what we now know in the science. I was wiggly guy all over the place going up and down and backwards. And, and I, there was some fundamental errors. Like I should have had a cortisone shot in my knee probably 18 months earlier than I did. And that would have probably protected a lot of cartilage. So just some things now that I'm, you know, if we could all wind back the clock, we would do things differently. Oh yes. Um, mm, So, Mm. 
but uh, yeah, so that's that, and that brings us up to, um, and then I will just add, I've had one relapse since two, it's uh, got rid of all the pain, got off the drugs around 2000 and gosh, probably 2014. So that's seven years ago. And for the, for no, let's say 2012. And so for about five years, it was like pain-free, drug-free, back to maximum energy, which was my mantra. Pain-free, wow. drug-free. And it does the last little bit of it doesn't even come off the tongue, but that's just how I used to do it. Wow. And uh, pain-free, drug-free, back to massive energy. I used to say massive because it doesn't, the syllable. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, and then I went out and then, and then to make a real, just to shorten this version of the story, uh, I, I went to a restaurant, felt bulletproof in Orlando and had a massive horrible oily meal and symptoms oh. came back uh, wow. in two, a couple of years back. And then it's taken me um, some time to get everything completely back under control again, because wow. the one deep, meal, one meal, wow. one meal, but it was a bad meal. It was deep fried veggie burgers and a huge bowl of deep fried chips. And wow. that that one meal stirred me up and, um, and one thing led to another, all things and COVID and I couldn't exercise and all that. So it's taken a long time to get oh. things, but, but now I'm, now I'm solid, but gee, yeah. that was, uh, that, that was, um, yeah, a big warning. If you're stable, never get complacent, never feel mm. bulletproof because we're living with, it's like the life of pie. We have this <laughs> living with a wild animal <laughs> and we can tame the animal, but it's still a wild animal. And yes. We learn how to tiptoe yeah. around it. We learn how to keep it happy, but it's right there. And the moment that you start doing something to irritate it, that yeah. animal will, will, will remember that it's biologically designed to kill you and mm -hmm. it will attack. So yeah. that's a great analogy. Um, mm. It's almost like uh, some patients, when uh, we talk about depression and mood, they feel like it's like this cloud or shadow that's always present but it's, it's, it's controlled until something that they don't take care of themselves. They don't get the sleep, whatever. And it just will take over and just kind of cover them. You know, it just kind of overtakes them. Um, similar type of idea, yeah. but yeah. Oh yeah. That's a great yeah. life of pie. <laughs> yeah, life <laughs> Tiger of in the boat. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was describing that once on a live call or something. And someone said, that's a great method in the chat. They liked it in the chat. And I'm like, oh, I've got, I've got to use that again, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. That's a fantastic yeah. uh, way to describe it. Wow. Mm. So when did you give up dairy? Was dairy also early, early on? Like how long have you been fully plant-based then? Oh, gosh. I've been, yeah, 10 years. Um, wow. Something I like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Dairy, dairy was one of the last to go. And I never really saw a correlation between an increased sorry let me back up all dairy was gone except i would occasionally have some yogurt mm. and i would eat yogurt when i was traveling and i was stuck at an airport with nothing to eat because when you're traveling it's hard as you know to get some plant foods especially oil-free plant foods mm. when you're highly uh, sort of sensitive with an ra condition so um i would sometimes have a dairy 10 years ago, a, a fermented uh, yogurt. Uh, and notice that I didn't really get symptoms triggered from that. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't your average Joe. Like I used to eat everything with salad. I would sometimes have some hot chips at an airport with a bag of baby spinach so yeah. that I could cheat the food into me. And it worked. It works. You can cheat the food in with a bag of leafy oh green. Oh my goodness, yeah. that is so at, funny. At the wow. restaurant where I uh, ate that shocking meal, I didn't eat a salad. It was 9.30 at night. The kids were screaming. We were all in the worst mood because our restaurant had closed that we normally went to. And hence we ended up at this place. So it was a yeah sequence of unfortunate events. Wow. Mm. wow. But wow. I always eat with a salad, especially if a meal I'm not sure about. I'll have a little sneaky salad afterwards so that I know that I'm going to be fine. Yeah. And I've yeah. always told my patients, you don't have to eat every meal. It'll be okay. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I promise exactly. you'll, you'll be, you'll wake up the next day. It'll be okay. Yeah. And they're like, I never thought of that. I was like, I know yeah. that's why I said it. 
<laughs> you'll be you'll be okay this it's yeah. you know it's funny too is it's kind of the similar thing with with parents i have so many parents and we're talking about their kids and this one mom she's like i have to fix four or five meals because you know they're one child wants this another child wants that mm -hmm. the husband wants this i'm trying to eat this and you know they're telling me how they're giving their kids this processed vegan food or just the animal products but there she's trying to cook herself and her husband more healthy i was like now let's halt this progress. First of all, why would you give your kids more unhealthy foods than you give yourself? Please explain to me, how is that being a loving parent? And they're just like, well, nobody's ever talked to me like that before. I was like, well, someone needed to. So I'm just like, mm. you know, let's think about what we're doing. First of all, you, these are children. You feed them, they'll eat or they'll be hungry. I promise they'll eat the next meal. This is how we learn. The world doesn't always serve you what you want. <laughs> Like it serves you rheumatoid arthritis or it served me, you know, uh, hypothyroidism. There's so many things that um, we just have to learn to accept and just, you know, deal with it and makes you a better person, I think. But for sure. And, and it's surprising too. the kids are unpredictable. So what we mm. what we found and this is like Melissa and I looked at each other and we're like, is this OK? But sometimes Melissa and I like to order a, a nice spicy Indian meal and we'll have that mm -hmm. at home. We found a place that eats cooks without oils nice. right nice. And, and we'll have that at home the kids don't like that but what we found is the kids think it's like their night off from having to eat the healthy plant-based dinners because you know what we give them on the nights that we have our hot spice we give them oat, we give them oatmeal and they love it they think <laughs> it's a treat they eat oatmeal for dinner and that's their greatest treat there's a little person oh my gosh i love it she's so cute <laughs> So the printers in here, they're printing some coloring pages so that they can do some drawing. Oh okay. my gosh, she's so cute. How old are your little ones? She's eight. Oh, it's for Father's Day. I don't know if it's Father's Day in the States, but it's No, this it's in, that's in June. Oh, they happy mix Father's up Day. The, oh, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, she's come to print something for Father's Day. So that's the cute factor that we've got going. So they get excited about oatmeal when oh they can't gosh. eat like what we're having. So, eat, and we don't say, kids, that's really healthy for you. You sh you know, you know that you're eating. No, we're just like, shh, they think it's a treat. So we'll let them eat it. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Oh my goodness, that is adorable. That's beyond adorable. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. No, but it's just, it's really just, you know, uh, yeah. Well, we did that because when I went to medical school, uh, my kids were five, three and 10 months old. When I started medical school, I, I took six years off to have them. And when we went back and I was always raised, you eat what you on your plate or you'll yeah. eat later just because we didn't have the money. But, you know, as a medical student and a mom of three, and my husband was active to the air force at that time and life was a little insane. Um, it just did them well. So when we went to the plant-based diet, when they were teenagers, they didn't give me grief. They really didn't. They're like, whatever mom cooks is what we got guys, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I allowed them to give me a thumbs up kind of this or thumbs down on the quality or taste. And they took, they relished those moments, but I was like, oh yeah, just wait till the next meal you guys are going to tell me it thumbs up i promise and sure enough eventually it. it took some time but uh yeah it was, a, it was a it was really fun we have fun talking about those days <laughs> yeah that's great so, you know, but, our yeah. kids use the same thing they call it the thumbinator that's what they call it and they use I two thumbs it. like this they have two thumbs and they go like this and if two thumbs up right but but they'll often come up with sort of you know non like they'll come they'll say it's that it's th that's where we're at with this meal and mum's like oh okay and I laugh and she's like rolling her eyes because they're basically <laughs> insulting her that it's not too fun. insulting but in a loving fun yeah. way but yeah. you know their dad's a stand-up comic so they got to throw in some kind of fun and <laughs> right right yeah so yes yeah, oh fun. my it's gosh fun. Yeah. how old are your kids seven five and three Oh my heavens, you're in mm. you're in the thick yeah. of it. Thick of oh. it. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Oh my goodness. So wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That yeah. is a lot of fun. Yeah, I have 20 years on you those kids. He's 27, 25, almost 23. <laughs> yes, I'll those are fun times. Their adults are fun, but other than you can't, you don't you lose control. It's like, yeah, right. oh shucks. Right. Darn. Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, yes. And yeah, Melissa okay. basically loses sleep over losing that kind of mummy is needed by the kids feeling. Oh. Yeah, mm. That's going to hit her hard. I, I will tell you something that worked really well with my boys. My daughter, I didn't have so much trouble with. My, I have a really, they're amazing kids. We're all super close. But the boys, you know, the moment like mom's dropping me off at middle school or mom's dropping me off at high school before they could drive. And I was like, you know, I was like, love you, Gabe. See you soon. Love you, Jonathan. Love you. And they were just like, shut the door. You know, I was like, okay, let me explain something. I bird you. We talked about this before the show. I was like, listen, either you tell me you love me in the closed compartment of this vehicle, or I will get out of this vehicle and chase you down and give you a big wet kiss and tell you I love you in front of all your friends. Never had another problem. Never since. So anyway, just saying. I love it. I love it. I <laughs> love a little it. peer pressure and a little, you know, humiliation involved like, ah, whatever. It strokes my ego. <laughs> I love it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So much fun. Uh, we got off topic. Talking about, I talk about kids forever, but moving yeah. on. So now you've taken all this incredible journey of ups and downs, your peaks and your valleys, and mm. you have a wonderful family supporting you. Where does it come to you that you're like, you know what? Other people need to know this information and please mm. share what that means in your journey to that. Cause that's such a wonderful program. So when I had what we call the cherry incident, which triggered my, my, you know, my diarrhea and, and vomiting and so on. The food poisoning was from cherry. So after the cherry incident, and I then did my, you know, water fasting, it struck me that um, if, if uh, this happened to me, then maybe it's happened to someone else. And I found information about this via Dr. McDougall's website. And I went on his website, bless him, being like so, so crucial for me and my health because he had links on his page directing me off to scientific journal papers about food sensitivities, about water fasting. And I'd, I'd finally found sort of some direction. And because I have a physics background, I have a first-class honours degree ah. in laser physics. And oh, so wow. I, Mm, my background's all light and lasers and stuff. And I, I like the science. So it, it resonates with me. And like, I actually, I nerd out about, I love the science. I could, yeah, look at the, look at journal papers all day and go late at night. I'm reading and getting excited about like certain bacterial strains that are injected into mice to introduce more rheumatoid arthritis. And then how that, how that plays out. And, and I, like this, this was, this was last night by way of example, instead of just chilling out and, and stuff. So anyway, I found out that there was a paper that showed that 14 people with rheumatoid arthritis were put on a seven day water fast. And at the end of the seven days, all their symptoms disappeared. When they were challenged again with foods, their symptoms came back. And I'm like, mm. I've just read a study about me. That's what right. happened to me. Wow. And so I thought this was the light bulb moment. I thought I represent everyone with this disease with what I've just been through. So if I can work this out, I can help people. And that became wow. a huge motivator. Wow. I bought a book called, um, uh, it was called Sonia St. Clair, um, Freedom from Rheumatoid Arthritis. It was the one of the only two books on Amazon at the time that described any kind of improvements or stuff with rheumatoid arthritis. It's amazing wow. how much things have changed in the last, like in 15 years, right? A mm -hmm. lot. Like on our podcast, we have virtually weekly a guest describing their uh, life-changing improvements through plant-based diet, a lot of the nuances associated with what I teach and exercise, reduction in stress. And, and, and it's just phenomenal. But back then I was like not aware of where to get information. Anyway, um, looking into this uh, more and more. Yeah, it was when I could see, look, I feel like I, oh, sorry, when I bought that book, Freedom from Rheumatoid Arthritis, um, I said to my wife, well, we're onto something. It's a diet related problem. Mm. And so we started documenting, I, I was doing it myself, just filming it myself with a little tripod and stuff. Um, and we gave up the documentation process because I was just not getting anywhere. And I thought, I'm never sharing this. And I still have the footage. There is some very raw footage of me, like just piece to camera, just me standing there in the most 
mm. forlorn situation and just talking about how how it feels virtually impossible it is to make progress and stuff. Mm. So we have all that, but there's also some funny footage of me going through my supplement cabinet and <laughs> drawer after drawer of stuff I was taking. Wow. And I watched it a few months ago and I'm laughing because I didn't even know what I was taking. I just said, oh, so-and-so said to take that. Or I read someone's took that. And we're talking about 20 or 30 things that I was wow. taking on and off over a few day period on, mm. on, on a repeat. So anyway, so I felt like if I can work this out, I can help other people. And it was only though I felt qualified or I felt worthy of being able to share some information after I had sort of been off my drugs for a period of time. My, my rheumatologist was, was sort of saying, you know, everything's fine. And my CRP remained consistent. And I've charted my CRP for, for 15 years. So I've got, I think, 90 90 kind of bullet points on a chart of all my C-reactive protein markers over, wow. over 15 years. And I keep a track of this stuff. So I felt like, yeah, I could share it. And so what happened was we, we put it online because I didn't want to publish a book in case no one, it didn't work for anyone else. So we just <laughs> went with the, like sort of the lowest vehicle to, to finding out if it works. We put it online. Mm. And the first person who bought it was a woman I won't name, but she's from Adelaide in Australia. I had to go to the post office because she was elderly and print out a 180 odd page uh, document and put it into a massive alligator clip and send it to her in the mail. That was our first person who started oh, our program. Wow. Three weeks later, she contacted me and said, this has changed my life. Like I can oh. now walk more i can extend my elbow more and okay. that's when melissa and i thought this can work for other people not mm. just me so that's when we started to put a little bit more effort behind it and uh it's now it's it's yeah it's it's really cool so we've had people in 62 countries that we've been wow. able to identify do our program we've had over 13,000 people engaged in our materials formally and doing our program. Um, and yeah, we've just, and obviously much larger numbers of people who just follow us, our, po our podcast, mm -hmm. Facebook, YouTube, all the social stuff. Uh, and you know, someone wrote me a handwritten letter yesterday that I opened yesterday. And I'm, how did they even get my home email, uh, home address? But anyway, <laughs> so yesterday I'm like reading it from a woman who who uh, hand wrote an, um, a note to me and said that she's been traveling across the country. She she doesn't need our support anymore. She's sort of apologizing for unsubscribing from our support program. She's like, I just don't need it anymore. I don't have any symptoms. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So like, yeah, it, it's really... Uh, it's really, really, really like mind blowing hearing nice, hearing the nice things. And I want to add that we don't teach anti-medication. We mm -hmm. teach maximum health. And if maximum health results in the requirement of less supplements and maybe some less pharmaceuticals, um, maybe, you know, some less things that are just sort of band-aids or, or patches or things that augment um, your natural healing, then that's mm. great. But that's not, we don't set out and have a goal of, mm. of I'm going to be no meds, no maximum health. And if the doctor says, look, you're doing great. Sure. Let's try and taper a little meds, but that's not the, that's not the objective. It's a result that exactly. we would like, but we don't specifically target. Mm. Yes. I feel like you're resonating exactly. I echo those same sentiments to all my patients. Number one, we're here to maximize your health where you are right now, because yeah. that may not be, you know, if you're 60, it's not going to be the same if I had got you at 20 or yeah. 40 or whatever. And the interesting thing about that is patients are really surprised when I say that, because, you know, we have to marry not only the, um, the lifestyle, right? The maximum lifestyle and eating and your social and your exercise. But we do have to be pay attention that sometimes medications are still required. And so I agree with you. I think that's a very healthy approach to share with people. Um, 
but yeah, that's, it, I always tell people, I was like, listen, my goal is to, <laughs> to get everyone so healthy that I have to go out of business. That'll be a fabulous day because it means that we've reached our objective and we're doing what we're meant to do as physicians, as healers. Um, we're actually doing it well and right. Um, and if we can't do that, then, well, we use a little bit of medications and we keep going, but I think mm. that's, that's a great uh, thing that you're saying. And what a great, yeah. I, I'm like, people are apologizing because you've done so much for them, yeah. <laughs> but I'm normal now. I don't have pain. Thank you. But I'm so sorry, but thank you. <laughs> and, that, and what made oh. me laugh, what made me laugh. And at first my heart like jumped because, uh, you know, this is fresh because it's yesterday. Um, but her first line was, hi, Clint. I'm writing to let you know that I've unsubscribed from your program. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, no. like, what have I done? And then she, but she went on to explain why. It was just an interesting sort of opening to her letter. Right. Um, uh, and just, but just on the medications things, yeah, and you and I have discussed this separately, mm. different different place. I, 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 I mm. recall that um, there are certain medications that I provide science around that are unhelpful for mm -hmm. long-term health. Uh, and specifically unhelpful for the environment of the gut microbiome. Um, mm -hmm. So I always caution um, folks to um, look, be careful about the overuse of antibiotics, the overuse of prednisone, the anti overuse of um, proton pump inhibitors, mm -hmm. because these three drugs have all, of course, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. Those four classes of drugs have all got strong evidence to show that they negatively impact the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And our whole, um, uh, well, one third of the approach of what we do is to improve the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if we are taking medications, which I describe as mostly discretionary, those drugs, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think a conversation is worthwhile with a rheumatologist to look at a disease modifying drug long-term sensible sort of rheumatoid drug to reduce or to come off some of these others that are mm -hmm. counterproductive to healing. Mm -hmm. So I agree. That's a great yeah. idea. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So can you describe the elements of your program? Because um, I think it's really cool to see, because I've watched several of your videos in your program and different things. Can you explain the continuum and kind of your, work through and how people can find it and where, what they should be doing. Yes, I, I almost, um, I, I feel like I have to explain a little bit of like why we do the stuff and then I'll explain like the okay. why and I'll keep it short because I know that we've been really chatty and having a great time. So, um, <laughs> so the three areas that we try to address, so I've mentioned the microbiome, the, the evidence on leaky gut and rheumatoid arthritis is so strong that it's, you know, in the past, when I used to see naturopaths in like 2007, they'd say leaky gut. And then you'd hear all of this kind of like controversy or uh, it's not really proven and all that sort of stuff. Now it is like, get, like nothing's guaranteed, but now the evidence is overwhelming. A July study, so just a, you know, really recent study that's just come out, um, has, has, has really, really consolidated the relationship between gut leakiness or intestinal permeability and joint inflammation severity. So this is, uh, um, you know, ma uh, analysis of the patient, multiple joints infected, um, but also um, C-reactive protein and inflammatory markers. And they've correlated inflammatory response to the amount of lipopolysaccharides in the blood coming from bacterial components and stuff so mm. it is solid so what we've got is we've got a microbiome dysbiosis we've got leaky gut we've actually got wow. particles of bacteria and some bacterial whole bacterium inside joints measured oh my goodness okay. wow. yes wow. yes so the stuff is coming from the gut wow. so we've got to get the gut right microbiome leaky heal leaky gut and we also have to deal with two other things the cell wall or the cell membrane of the human cells where we've got the fluidity. This is an omega-6, omega-3 uh, omega question. We have to deal with our fats. So the chapter of my book is called Get Your Fats Right. Uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 if we get our fats right, then we're going to do really well. And then the other part of it is oxidative stress. And so when the immune system is constantly engaged, it creates free radicals to actually 
try and destroy the invader that it senses at the joint level mm. but the process of creating these free radicals um, actually causes some damage to the tissue structure so we have to deal with that as well and that can be best handled through exercise so it's not all diet so we address all of those things um, with essentially to oversimplify it a two-day celery cucumber juice we have a baseline foods and everyone can become Dr. Shinya for a week. And then we have, uh, then we have a reintroduction process that is foods in a specific order for their evidence-based or anecdotal based experience based value. And then people go through this process. And then there's a milestone sequence where we're trying to hit milestones, like reduce non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, talk to the doctor about coming off prednisone, hopefully, uh, and so on. And ultimately just trying to, the goal is complete confidence and control. That's our goal. It's not remission. It's not cure. Cure doesn't exist. Complete confidence and control. And if we can achieve that, we're living a happy life. We're living an ins a life that can inspire others against the odds. And we're living a life that is um, harm free and, uh, and planet safe and and something to be proud of, you know, it's a life that, that feels good, despite what we've been, what we've been uh, having to, to go through. So, you know, what? most people, when they see a, a path to get from A to B, and it looks good, and it's science based, and they see so many other people succeed, mm -hmm. they're pretty motivated, they don't mind if they have to, you know, give up a few of their favorite foods, because mm. this is a, this is, this is a mission. And yeah. once they get into this zone, and you see improvements, it's exciting, you know, and it's, mm. it's, it's really becomes, becomes like all encompassing and people are mm. so determined and it's fun. So yes. yeah, that's it. They become evangelical. They yep. really do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's really funny because you'll have some patients like you, I'll introduce a plant-based diet before people were congregating to us. <laughs> plant -based diet, they're already kind of plant-based warm. Um, I had one patient was like, I'm just not going to do it. And what was so funny was that when he finally adopted a plant-based diet and he had such significant results, weight loss, joint pain, you name it, um, blood pressure improved, diabetes, he became the big, biggest advocate. And he had come to me sometimes like, Dr. Marvis, why don't people listen? Do they not see what could happen? I was like, I don't know. You were just like them. Tell me, what was your change? <laughs> and I was like, use your experience because you were just like them. And he's like, oh, I'm like, yeah, oh. <laughs> That's fantastic. So funny. Yeah, oh my yeah. goodness. You must have the biggest advocates or the people who go through your program. I mean, you must not even need to advertise because you just have word of mouth from person to person to person. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, you know, what I laugh about is, you know, if you see a testimonial about a soap, it's like, I put this soap on and my skin feels better now each day. My skin is not as dry. And like our, our sort of testimonials are, look, I won't go to the real dark ones to begin with. I'll say something like, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I, I was so depressed. Um, I, you know, couldn't lift the kettle up to make my morning breakfast, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then it's like, you know, now I wake up in the morning, I have good energy, I sleep better, I can create a fist, of course, that's the rheumatoid sort of signal mm. of success. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, to doing stuff in my life. And let's be real, right? There are also people who really struggle to make progress as well. Mm. Um, look at me. I mean, I was just extraordinarily challenging case, if you like, um, even with my sort of mistakes I made, if I'd have done everything perfectly, I still think it would have taken me years, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, the, the, patience. there's no guarantees. And I think that getting the diet right is like the foundation of a house. We, we, mm -hmm. we, we see the science. It's, it's so crystal clear. The two reviews, one in 2017, one in 2019, they both summarize from all the scientific literature and all of the evidence that exists from all the studies over the past 30 years with, with rheumatoid arthritis and diet. They both independently conclude that a plant-based diet with the avoidance of food sensitivities is the path forward. Now mm. that's powerful. So mm. 
if you do that and you're still not getting the results that you hope for, well, at least it's the foundation of your house. You know that there's no other better way you should be building that house. Build that and then let's work on every other thing, every other aspect. Mm -hmm. Do you have a history of like exposure to pesticides and chemicals and things that we need to investigate? And Or do you have, you know, uh, uh, a situation where you're in a really toxic relationship? Or, I mean, all of the other things that can affect the microbiome, and this is going to get complicated, but but at least we have a foundation. So mm -hmm. that's how I view it. Mm. Yeah, I think you just have to keep digging a little deeper and build your foundation yeah. a little deeper. Yeah. <clears throat> that's really true because, you know, as you know, my friend Chris Miller and her lupus, mm -hmm. I don't know if you went into her lupus story much, but, you know, I've known Chris for 10 years. And when she would hear stories of people with lupus who would switch to Flabby yeah. side and Ta -da, I'm better. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Lori, I'm Flabby side didn't make me fully better. I was like, Chris, there's a reason. There's a reason you're going through this journey because you are meant to help people and you are going to learn the intricacies and the ins and outs and all the, the special nuances. And she's such a brilliant human, so smart and able to put these connections together. It's like, it will come, I promise. And, um, you know, and she's, she's been blessed with that. She's, um, you know, she, she obviously has occasional things that will happen, but it's been really amazing to see her journey and what she's learned and how she's able to help people with really tricky cases. Cause there's other people just like her, you know, who really struggle and don't just get better overnight and, and just can't quite figure it all out. So I, I think I applaud your patience. That's, mm. that's the other thing we're missing. And I think in our culture is patience, just sit mm. back and just keep doing the work. You know? mm. Yeah. With Chris's situation as well. And, learning it the hard way there's just no better way to then be able to draw upon a memory you know it's hard to remember a study or something that someone said at a lecture or something but when you have discovered or or, or, or overcome something that just was consuming you for months sometimes mm. years you never forget that and you can mm. pull upon that when you're helping someone else and so um like my friend Joel, a uh, stand-up mate of mine. And, uh, you know, whenever I was going through something, he would just say exactly what you said to Chris. And he mm. would say, add it to the book, add it to the story, <laughs> add it to this. He said, it's, you know, just, this is, this is powerful. This is another lesson. And, mm. you know, you, from what I said before, you know, I was still making some mistakes like a few years back when I had that horrible greasy meal. Now mm. I'll never do that again. <laughs> I will think of Laurie saying, you know, you can skip a meal and I will skip a meal. <laughs> I won't eat for a week if I can avoid that. Right. Well, so. you know, those are, that's a ex perfect example yeah. of when I have patients, regardless of whatever they're trying to overcome or do, mm. and they quote unquote fall off, you know, the wagon and they're trying to get back on. I was like, listen, these are wonderful opportunities to learn. How can you succeed without failure? If I have yet to figure out anyone who never failed and succeeded to the max, you know, and just flew. Um, and if they say they never failed, then they're lying. Um, and I would be willing to challenge anyone on that. But these are wonderful opportunities to learn. Well, what do I do now to prepare for future circumstances? Yeah. What happened? What set you into that motion? How can yeah. we prevent it in the future? And, um, but yeah, you're, that's a, exactly right. It's a great opportunity to learn and learn not yeah. what to do again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and thinking about that, like as well, um, it led me down a, a, a massive research path into mm. oxidative stress. That's where like my whole understanding was driven by, because I wanted answers. Why surely one really oily meal couldn't mm. disrupt my microbiome so much that now I had all this leaky gut, there's got to be something more to this. And that was an extraordinarily uh, uh, valuable amount of education that I got in the subsequent 12 months. And I mm. um, you know, feel that that information has just been crucial for my more complete understanding of what's going on. And it'll never be complete. And I don't, and, and, and I'm still humbled by the incredible publications that I can often barely understand, but we try and we keep mm. trying and we keep mm. trying to put it into words that we can understand and other people can understand. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, That's fabulous. Cause there's, mm. there's, you know, so many doctors who don't even open a medical journal 
you know, they open it enough to study for their boards or whatever, but right. they don't stay up in touch or, or they don't mm. have the curiosity to look further and deeper for their patients, mm. which is, it's really sad because those are their minds because they have the basis and the experience to understand yeah. where those clinically that research could play out and have positive effects. Mm. And um, it, it is unfortunate that at least in the United States, I don't think we mm. do enough mm. of that. So mm. um, it may yeah. be different in other places, but uh, definitely an American. Um, I don't see it. So well, there's a lot going on, isn't there? I mean, you've got, you've oh. got your rent to pay, you've got your staff to pay, you've got insurance to, to deal with. I'm sure you've got mm. patients trying to, trying to, in your case, book telehealths at weird hours of the mm-hmm. night when they're from strange countries <laughs> like mine and, you know, all this stuff going on. And yeah. then you're on top of that. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, hard. I guess it really depends. So, you know, obviously I raised my kids and I was a mom and a doctor, but there comes a point though, why did you go to medical school? Why did you go to four years of college, four years of medical school and three to five years of residency? You don't just Mm. do that without some type of deep, maybe there's some Mm. cognitive issues going on in the majority of us, but um, you know, you don't do that without a true desire to seek Mm. and wellness and healing opportunities for patients. I think what happens though, in our system, at least in the United States, that is so complicated and destructive and disease promoting, right? Um, That doctors just just are so tired. They're just trying to keep their heads above water between all the administrative burden, the malpractice worries, and you just keep ordering things and you just keep, you know, prescribing and the churning of patients through. And, um, you know, and it also goes back to medical school. When you're in medical school, we aren't ever taught like, listen, we're going to present you with a healthy human. How do you keep them healthy? That should be the first yeah. lesson. This yeah. is the healthy human. Let's keep them this way. And then when things go right, this is what you do. Um, it just like this common sense approach is just not taught. So I don't know. It's just a really interesting place yeah. we're in right now in history. We'll see where it all plays out, I suppose. Yeah, I often wonder like, When's the day going to happen that someone who is the health minister or God forbid, even the, you know, president or he, the prime minister Mm. is going to be plant-based and they're going to say, Hey, do you know what? All these guidelines that we follow from the, from the, you know, authorities that say a little bit of this, a little bit, Mm. why don't we just sort of look at these studies Mm. you know, which are epidemiological studies and show if you do this, you're all healthier. Mm-hmm. Why don't we do that? And I have I say just to my friends and stuff that if they say, but what about like the dairy farmers or farmers who have cows and that's their livelihood and they're not, they're not hurting anyone, they're innocent. And I say the money that we'll save by not keeping people in hospital from mm-hmm. cardiac problems, from diabetes and so on and so on, cancer mm-hmm. and stuff, the reduction in the number of people suffering with those Let's buy out every farmer in the country, put them into grand five-star hotels on the coast overlooking the water, pay every bill that they'll ever have and give them the greatest life ever for the money that we'll save on health costs. I think you're exactly right. Unfortunately, (laughs) the wheels of industry and big government here... um, it's going to have to be uh, uh, from yeah. the ground up because here, and as you are well aware of our politics and our issues, or maybe not, maybe you choose not to, I try to tune them out and I live here. Um, it's a, it's a disaster when you have our Congress that is literally, you know, they represent big, big pharma, big agriculture, they're not caring about their constituents in their day-to-day health. They're not, they, if they just do not. And um, I went to DC one time back in what year was that? 2017 with some friends of mine who were also physicians. We were all women and we had actually set up a meeting with some of the congressmen that represented our different territory states and it was really interesting because we were speaking about the future of healthcare, not necessarily in a plant-based context, but you know, looking at what's occurring, what can we do to make better? And one of them said, you know, you're not going to be able to get in front of other people unless you pay. And I was like, excuse me? It's like, 
yeah, you have to pay in order to speak to these elected congressmen that we put them there. You have to pay, you know, you're going to have to all these, you make a donation and then you'll get five minutes with them. I'm like, <laughs> really just made me boil to the point I thought my head was going to literally pop off my body. And I was like, you must be kidding me. And um, at that point, I was like, you guys can keep wasting your time here, but I'm going to go to where the people are going to be listening yeah. because they're the ones hurting. And that's how we're going to change things. However, there is a really interesting, are you aware of who Eric Adams is? So Eric Adams was, so in New York City, there's different boroughs, like neighborhoods, so to speak. Yeah. And he was one of the, I think they call them borough presidents. And I've interviewed him twice, remarkable person. He was a police officer. Anyway, he had developed severe diabetes through a turn of events, found a plant-based diet, reversed his diabetes, became the biggest advocate of a plant-based diet in his borough in New York City. And now, now it looks like he's going to be the mayor of New York. He is this close to being the mayor of New York. I was like, what in the world? This is the coolest thing. So that may be the beginning of the tipping of the political will or scale in our direction. And I do believe we have one congressman also in the United States that's also plant-based. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I would just find it so fascinating that here is a man who is a staunch plant-based advocate mm -hmm. going to be the mayor of one of our largest cities. This will be very interesting. Yeah, that's really cool, especially since he's outspoken. This yes. Is cool. And did you hear about the the restaurants um, in New York? It's one of them. It's like I think it has three Michelin stars. Yes, I have heard about that. And yeah, they, my, he also my mother in law. Place. My mother in law sent me that. She said, "Look at this," and she uses WhatsApp. And she, my mother in law sends me all this vegan stuff. And <laughs> yes, um, she did send me that, and it looked really Amazing. cool. Like they, I think they were re renovating their whole restaurant but when they come back it's going to be all plant-based if i'm correct. They, they're already plant-based and they're already right. back right so covid right. really made the mm. owners sit back and go what are we doing you know they helped prepare meals they opened up their commercial kitchen to feed mm. the hungry of new york the you wow. know with food insecurity and then now with every meal that's purchased of course it's high end and it's six months or a year to get in it's a meal that I won't be able to afford at least maybe half a meal, but you know, it's all multiple course dinners and those meals actually go and they they'll buy five meals for food insecure individuals in New York city, which is amazing. I think, wow, that's yeah. such a wonderful gift. Yeah. So you're taking your platform and your, your talents and presenting these foods in such a remarkable way. And um, mm. yeah, it's pretty awesome. That pretty is, cool. that's exciting. <laughs> I love that stuff. Yeah, we'll have oh to book my goodness. I might put oh. a booking in. Yes, put a booking in then. So when you make it, yeah, exactly. come back over. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, the, the food oh will be warm goodness. for me in 2024. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Well, I know I kept you well past the hour that I booked here. So I apologize for that. But it's been so much fun talking to you. First of all, please share with everyone where they can find you, where they can look at your program. Um, and then the name of the podcast, all those wonderful things. And then what would be the last bit of advice that you would give to someone who is like listening to this and intrigued, but what would be like the first step you think? Yeah. So in terms of where to find us, start with the podcast, um, you know, try before you buy to, you know, see if it's right for you. We, we've got uh, everyone, uh, everyone we interview is just wonderful like yourself um, over at uh, Rheumatoid Solutions Podcast. Um, so we're evolving into a rheumatoid solutions kind of branding. Uh, originally, all this began under the under uh, Patterson Program, which you can go to pattersonprogram.com, uh, and you can also check out rheumatoidsolutions.com. We've made the brand shift because of we had one doctor who took it upon himself, uh, who thought it would be fun to t uh, tear us a terrible review online. And it, and it really hurt us. And he knows nothing about our program. He's an oncologist um, and uh, has a very, very strong blog. Uh, and um, yeah, that hurt oh, wow. us. And so for, mm. you know, as a shift, we've, we've, we're changing brands and it's fine. Um, so we, uh, we, I don't we think that's fine, but okay. <laughs> look, what you send are you me doing? that name, please. You take yeah. another, you take a hit and you move on. People need a life. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Mm. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, start with the podcast. And then, uh, in terms of one tip, um, 
You know, there's so many sort of different things I could say, but I think it comes back to hope. You know, mm. if, if we feel like there's no hope, then normally that is a indication of just not having a game plan. And I used to feel directionless, uh, not knowing which way to go because there's this diet, there's that diet. The exercise sounds good, and the, but it hurts my joints. Um, you know, I, uh, what about this supplement? Because my doctor recommends it, but then Clint says you shouldn't do it, right? Mm. It gets so confusing and overwhelming. And I think that just building a game plan based on the science is the strongest, the strongest path mm. forward. And there is the science. There, there is the science. And let's summarize it. The science says a low-fat plant-based diet, you've got to eliminate your food sensitivities. The science says you've got to exercise more. A safe exercise done without irritating your joints is going to reduce inflammatory markers. Mm -hmm. And then so many commonsensical things like you've got to get to bed before 11 o'clock at night, right? Mm -hmm. we've, we've got to drink a lot of water during the day. We've got to have elevated or good vitamin D levels. These vitamin D levels correlate with the uh, onset of RA. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, low vitamin D is associated with, with uh, development of rheumatoid arthritis. Get your vitamin D levels up. Mm -hmm. get you work on your cell membranes get your fats right okay mm -hmm. um and uh let go of toxic relationships if you're in them mm -hmm. one of our um, guests on our podcast actually physically moved cities because of a toxic relationship that she couldn't get away from. another quit wow. her job both have transformed because of eliminating toxic relationships um mm -hmm. watch the medications that you're on if you're on one of those four that we mentioned before you're going to have like a shackle around your ankle it's not going to be hard it's not going to be easy to make progress. Talk mm. to your doctor. You know, all of this stuff. And that is the game plan. Mm. Put down a couple of goals for yourself. Incant each day that you're getting better. You, I'm feeling good. Every day I'm getting better and better. Each day I'm getting stronger. I feel mm. good. Mm. I'm in control. Mm. These words are going to help to suppress the negative thoughts that keep coming into our mind and get everyone around you including your doctors to be your cheerleaders you're the ceo they work everyone works for you to cheer you along and you can do this and every day ask yourself what can i do right now to reduce inflammation then do it and as soon as you're done what's your next question what can i do now to reduce inflammation and you will make progress no matter where you're at mm -hmm. you clint patterson are a prescriber of hope no doubt and if anyone not listening to this and they could see your face in the glow and the joy, there's no doubt in my mind that you'll continue to change and transform lives. And I'm just, I'm thankful to have met you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Laurie. Likewise, from the moment that I saw you present a few years ago at the uh, International Plant-Based Conference, and I thought she just looks so nice. I'd really like to know her. And I'm so grateful that we've been able to connect in the last few months. And thank wow. you for having me on your show. Oh, well, thank you. And everyone check it out, please. I, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I have patients also who've done the pat, well, rheumatoid solutions program, the Patterson program, and it's uh, been quite phenomenal for them as well. So I, I will applaud your efforts. And I, I just, again, I can't ex tell you it's so nice to and refreshing to speak to people who heal themselves. And I just, it must be such a joy every day to, to speak to those who've gone through your program and you've helped. So thank you again and thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time thanks for watching and i hope you enjoyed that video before you go though please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos on monday we upload the healthy human revolution podcast now if you'd rather listen to the podcast you can find it on all the major platforms such as itunes google play soundcloud and even spotify now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.